book of Jude. We're going to begin reading in verse number 17 this morning. And the Bible says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the Spirit. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, Jude... It's a short book in the Bible, but it's jam-packed with a whole bunch of stuff. We don't have time to cover everything. But by way of introduction, I want you to notice a few things in these verses. First, we know that all epistles were written to the church. We'll prove it, Brother Jordan. Got it. Verse number 17. But, beloved, who are the beloved of God? Those who have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and received the adoption of sonship, and they've been birthed into the family of God. God loves everyone, but God cannot bestow His love upon those that have not been added to the family. These are those that have been loved. That's what beloved means. God has a love for all. That is that omnipresent, always been around since the beginning of time, love with, you know, wherewith, back before the earth was ever founded. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Why? Because God had a love for people. But you cannot receive that love and become beloved until you receive Christ. So he says, But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. So where did this come from? Jesus. Now, this isn't man's authority. This isn't man's logic or man's knowledge. This was handed down from Jesus to the apostles and from the apostles to the church. Okay? It says how that they told you there would be mockers in the last time. Now keep in mind, they thought they was living in the last times when this epistle was written. Now granted, they lived in a world with an evil dictator named Nero that was persecuting Christians to the extent that, I dare say, they haven't been persecuted to since, where they were being thrown into coliseums, not just the coliseum, but arenas all across Rome being fed to ravenous animals that were being hunted down, executed because they proclaimed the name Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Not to mention that later on, those that lived through the Spanish Inquisition thought that they were living in the last times. Because those that refused infant baptism and didn't believe in Mary, and that Mary was the, you know, one of the roads to you to reach heaven, right? They were burned at the stake, they were killed, they were torn asunder, drawn and quartered, they suffered all manner of horrible things, and they thought they were living in the last... Now look at what we're living in. They thought that the thoughts of men in their day and age were evil continually, like in the days of Noah. Well, nowadays we think the same thing. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? Everything's been fulfilled for them to come back. I know that we're living on nothing but the grace of God. The time has already come to fruition that he said after Israel would become a nation, that a generation would not pass away. Well, what's that mean, Brother Jordan? He can come at any point, but just because we think we're in the last days doesn't mean we are in the last of the last like we may think that we are. When's he coming? We don't know. But I know that in the last days he said that there would be mockers who should walk after their own ungodly lust. Who are those that mock God? Those that reject anything having to do with God's order, God's law, having anything to do with Christ being the way, the truth, the life, we think that mockers are those that stand up against you and then try to poke fun at what you believe. Well, that's one example. But the way that this world lives every day is a mockery of everything that God stands for and everything that God originally created. God created perfection. Every day that man lives in sin, it mocks what God originally intended. Every day that someone embraces the ideology that they know what's best for their life mocks God. The way that this world lives unrepentant and unabashed in their openness in sin is a mockery against everything that you live every day in your life which says, Jesus knows what's best for me and I separate myself from those things. 
Right? They don't have to bring railing accusation against you in order to mock you or what you believe. They mock what we believe, and they mock this Bible every day by what they live. And in the last days, there would be those that were mockers. And what's it say? That not only would they be mockers who should walk after their own ungodly lust. What makes them a mocker that they embrace ungodliness? God says, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Those that embrace unholiness, wickedness, walking after their own lust, they mock the very presence of God because by their actions they say there is no God and there are no consequences. They can live how they want to and they get to decide how it ends. Uh, verse number 19. These be they who separate themselves sensual. Now, are we not to be called out? Are we not instructed in the Bible to be ye separate from the world? We're in the world, but not of the world. Well, we separate ourselves to what? Godliness. What do these mockers, these that live after their own lust, what do they separate themselves also, but they separate themselves sensual? Now, what's that word mean? Literally, it means natural. Things that you can sense. What you can see, what you can hear, what you can feel, what you can taste, what you can go out into the world and interact with. But what does the Bible tell us that faith is? Faith is the essence of things. So for the evidence of things not seen. You can't lay hand on faith. The world is obsessed with what they can see, touch, interact with. Well, you can interact with God, but it's not done through a 12-step process. It's not done through so many Hail Marys or Our Fathers. Your interaction with God functions on this thing called faith, which can't be seen. But these people separate themselves of those things which can only be seen. The natural man is the one that said in the garden, it looks good. You remember when serpent lied to Eve she looked at the tree and saw that it was good for fruit that looks like some good fruit that was the embracing of the carnal man the sensual man before that she never laid eyes on the fruit didn't matter what she could see what she could all that matters is that she had fellowship with God but in that point she thought that she could become as God and therefore become like the one that she loved so much then she started looking and feeling and thinking with the sensual side of herself. And what did that lead to? It led to her disobedience, and then Adam, being the same way, knew how much he loved to have Eve, and he wanted Eve more than he wanted God, which is why he chose to partake of it too. Why? Because of the sensual man. Another word for that sensual part of ourselves is carnal. The desires of the flesh. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Right? That carnal man is the old man, the dead man. That's the sinful man. Well, the world, all they know is carnal. They were conceived in carnality, born into it. They're sinners by practice, sinners by trade, just like you were before you got saved. Before you got saved, sinning didn't bother you. Well, here it says that these are they who separate themselves sensual. There's a difference between having the idea and doing it. I mean, go back and watch TV shows from yesteryear where it's in black and white. You're never going to hear mention of a dude that laid down with another dude or vice versa. There were certain things that people had the thought but they knew to stay in the closet because if they came out of the closet they was going to get the tar beat out of them. Right? Because society as a whole said we don't condone that around here. But see, so many have been giving themselves over to the sensual man that nowadays those things which used to be done in secret now are done openly. They have separated themselves to the sensual. They embrace it wholeheartedly and then try to thrust it upon society and say, you have to be okay with it too. They're making a mockery not just of God, but of what America used to be. We don't want that old time stuffy, you know, Mayberry Street. We want the progressive movement. Keep it. 
Progressive means you're headed towards something. And the Bible says, if a man thinketh he stand, let him take heed lest he fall. You're going to come, come, you progress yourself right off the edge of a cliff eventually. The old ways are the ones that are proven. There are none that say restore the old paths. Why? Because the world further embraces the carnal man, the sensual side of themselves. But notice also, it says, having not the Spirit, capital S, if you get the right Bible. Mockers cannot, or I should say, should not, be those that have received Jesus Christ. You cannot wholeheartedly embrace the sensual when you've got the Holy Ghost sealing your soul and indwelling your body. We know that those that are without God, they will get to a point where God will sear their conscience as a hot iron. They become reprobate, which means God will not deal with them about their sin problem and having to be saved ever again. They've gone too far. You don't find that with a Christian. You find that God will turn a Christian over to the destruction of the flesh that the soul might be saved. God won't let you get to the point that your entire life is a mockery of what is your testimony that you believed on Jesus Christ. You can go too far, but He's not going to sear your conscience. He's going to kill you. He's going to put you in the grave so you don't become a mocker of His Son. Well, how does he have that authority? He bought you with the price. The price of his very own son. The blood of his only begotten. So he has the right to do that. But see, this world isn't God's. God doesn't chase the devil's children. What happens to them? They become more sensual, more carnal. They're without God. That's how they can do the things they do without having a conscience towards it. Now, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that in the last days, he's saying it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And just when they thought it couldn't get any worse, a few generations later, it got worse. And we get to the point today where we're at. You know what I heard this week? Y'all know that I like watches. I don't spend big money on watches. I wait for them to go on clearance. And now I've got so many that I like, I don't need no more. I've got one to go with every outfit that I could possibly wear. We're good. All right, I don't need no more unless one of them breaks. Okay, Miss Rhonda, I've got the ones now that I don't even need watch batteries for them anymore. They're automatics. I don't even need to go buy batteries anymore. Oh, I could find more, but it doesn't. Right now, I've convinced myself I don't need no more. I had to do that because if I didn't do that, I'd need a bigger watch box, and we're running out of room anyway. I only got one, you know, one arm I can wear a watch on, and you can't wear like four of them at a time. Anyway, okay, I could try, but it's not going to go good. But I heard it was this week or last week, if you have a decent watch, I'm not talking a Rolex, not talking a Breitling, not talking about all those high dollar ones that you know they they got French names that this hillbilly can't pronounce. Right? I'm talking about just a decent watch. And you're walking around the streets of London, England. There are guys that will run up, chop your hand off with a machete to steal your watch and then go pawn it off. Happening every day. You say, in our world? In our world. Not out in, you know, middle of nowhere barbarian land. Right? London, England. Like that's where the, the ritzy people live, right? They got kings and queens still. Right? But they're getting hands lopped off because a guy wants to steal their watch. You say, that ain't coming. Well, we've been saying it for years, we being people behind pulpits, that whatever's on that side of the ocean is eventually going to make its way over here. You say, well, that wouldn't be... Well, you remember when uh, everybody was embracing a one-world government in, the, in Europe? They all had the euro... They were all joining under one. Well, that don't ever happen over here. Now what's happened? America's looking for any excuse that they can get to join one. All of the terrorist attacks that happened in Europe, well, that won't happen over here. Well, only reason it hadn't happened over here is because some people had enough common sense to, you know, go fight them instead of just saying, yeah, come on in. It'll all be good. If, you, if you're nice to them, they'll be nice to you. There's one problem with that. Their religion teaches that they have to kill you. Because to live in the same neighborhood as an infidel makes them unclean. 
That's what their religion teaches. What does ours teach? That we're to love the world. We're supposed to live peaceably among all men. But what happens? They're embracing the carnal, the sensual. And just because today our society isn't embracing it doesn't mean it won't be tomorrow. We got a whole, long, a whole lot wrong in America, but it could be a whole lot worse. But, and I've got to be honest with you, it's going to get a whole lot worse before Jesus comes back. Jude knew that. He's writing the church and saying, y'all know this, you've heard this, this isn't new. He said, as you've heard from the apostles and Jesus. He said, you've heard it taught, I'm just reminding you. Don't lose sight of the fact that it's going to get worse in the world, but that doesn't mean that it has to affect the church. That's where we get to the next verse. Verse number 20 says, But ye, beloved, again, say folk, those that have the capital S spirit, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He says, everything that's happening down here, that's not life. You were born, but you're not going to die here. Life does not begin and end on the earth. Life began at Calvary. He says, we're looking unto eternal life. The worse that the world gets, the sooner I know Jesus is coming back. Yeah, it's awful that we got to deal with it, and it vexes our spirit. Right, it makes living for the Lord a little bit harder than what we would like. But if it's easy, anybody would do it. If it was easy to be right with God, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die on the cross. If it was easy to become that new creature, Jesus wouldn't have had to send the Holy Ghost in order to help you become the new creature. Right, it may take a little bit more work, but it's still worth doing. This world is not our home. My home is a fair land where there's no imperfections. In fact, it's so great, it don't even need the sun and the moon because Jesus is going to be the light of that city. Right? It's got everything that you could ever desire, Him. It's got everything that I could ever need, Him. I'm not impressed with the world because guess what the world doesn't have? Him. I'm looking unto eternal life. Well, in order to look at eternal life, who do you got to look at? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He started it, and he's going to finish it. So to look unto eternal life, who you got to look to? Jesus. Because he said he was the way, the truth, and the life. Came that we might have life, and life more abundantly. Right? He's always been alive. He took a nap for three days, but he wasn't dead. He laid down his life and picked it back up again. He just took a robe off and then put it back on. Well, it says, Ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. As I, in the context of what he's talking about here, the world getting worse and worse. He's saying, you need to build yourselves up. I think of a storm coming into the coast. The waves of a normal day may be fine. You may have bricks laid up to where the waves aren't coming in to your property. But every now and then a hurricane hit. And what happens when a hurricane hits? Those people that didn't build themselves up or build their properties up, they're flooded. Why? Because they thought, well, it'll never come in this far land or this far inland. The waves will never get so high that my house gets flooded. I'm 50 or 60 or 70 miles away from the coast. Well, you think that until what? The storm hits. He's saying, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Notice he says, building. That is a continual word. You never get to the point where you've built yourself up enough on your faith that you can lay down your tools and stop building. Why? Because the worse and worse that the world gets and the bigger the waves get, you're going to keep, have to keep building to keep the water out, to keep the damage out. But how do you think we can go out and win the world without putting a wall up to keep the world out from where we're trying to get to? If we want God to do business, what do we have to do? We've got to separate ourselves. How are you going to do that without building yourself up? We're on the solid rock. 
We can't be moved. Right? I'm planted there. But the world's going to do all they can to throw all the water that they can into my property on the rock. It's still just as flat and still just as level. It's the chief cornerstone that God promised that Jesus would be. But that doesn't mean that the world's not going to try and rain on your parade. What do you got to do? You got to keep building yourself up. Every now and then a storm comes along and the wall kept the water out, but the wall got damaged. What do they got to do? Tear it out and put up a new wall. That's what that verse... Stand in the edge, make up the gap. You got to look for a problem in order to fix it. Just because the wall looks okay on your side doesn't mean that the wall's sturdy on the outside. In fact, a lot of times those breakwaters that they build, they've got multiple layers. Why? Because the outermost layer will take the brunt of the force, that's the strongest, but then the next walls are to dissipate the water. You can do it that way without building up his eye. What's that mean? You've got to go out into the world and put down some markers, set some standards to keep those waves from reaching those that you care about and want to see God go out and do something in their life. Build yourselves up, not on what you can do. Don't build yourselves up upon how strong you are or how able you are to take care of your problems we're talking about the whole world here. We're talking about the church. You think you're strong enough to keep a church together? No. You may think you are. I'll leave it alone. But you're not. You think that you're strong enough that outside of the help of God you can keep your own family together? You think that you're strong enough to keep your friends and your family from dying and going to hell on your own? We're not to build ourselves up on us. And just as I am carnal, still robed in this sin-cursed flesh, right? I've got that part of me that isn't perfect, but I've also got that part of me that he purchased with his own blood and is robed in his righteousness. But just as much as I know that I am weak and I am able to fail, I'm not to build myself up on somebody else. Right? We're not to have idols of man. Why? Because man's man. We are what we are by the grace of God and nothing else. But we are to build ourselves up not just on any faith, not just any belief, not any hope that you have. There's a lot of things that people are hoping in and they've got faith in today that isn't worth a plug nickel. Some people are hoping in the stock market. Lord help you. Might I recommend going and seeing a doctor and getting some good ulcer medication and some antidepressants? Because if you're watching the stock market every day, you're going to be depressed and a nervous wreck. Now, there's some people that put their faith in, Lord help them, the government. Or in a politician. There are people that build their lives around certain ideals, uh, ideologies and concepts that man came up with. You say, prove it. Well, there's a real wicked one called communism, socialism, right? There are people that, for lack of a better term, right, they bought into whatever inspirational or motivational speaker that they went and heard, and they buy all their books, and they're trying to live their life like that guy said. They're building themselves up on people. They're building themselves up on the ideologies of man. Man's ever learning, but what? Unable to come to the knowledge of truth. Man's always coming up with something new, but there's nothing new under the sun. It's all the same thing, just with a different label on the front. But there's something to be said about what works. What's that? Well, thus saith the Lord. Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. What are we to build ourselves up on our most holy faith? Not just a belief, not just a desire. That one day I'll be able to retire and go down to wherever it is and live there. Well, if the Lord willeth. The way things are going, Brother Ron, I'm thinking I may not get to retirement age. He may call us out of here long before that. But, he says, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. We could do months just on prayer 
through prayer. Prayer just big, well, it's actually not a big word. It's a little small word that means just talking with God. The Bible talks about there are many different types of prayer. Right? We know that there's supplication. We know that there's intercessory prayer. We know that there's the giving of thanks. We also, and then the Apostle Paul goes on to say, and prayer. What's that? That's just talking with God every day. Pray without ceasing. What's that? Just always be talking with God. Right? It doesn't have to be overly formal. You don't have to learn how to speak old English in order to pray. People have been praying to God long before English was ever around. People have been talking to God the way that God desires to be talked to since long before any of this was written. True prayer is getting down on your face before God, humbling yourself, if not outwardly, certainly inwardly. Right? Jesus gave the model prayer was he say, our Father. Even then, he said, there's going to be some, not just me, there's going to be some blood-bought. They're in the family now. Right? Our Father, who art in heaven, what's that? That's humbling yourself, saying, you are high and I am lowly. Hallowed be thy name. What does that mean? You holy. Now, I'm not holy. Let the world recognize that your name is holy. That everything you do is holy. And then what's he go on to do? He asks for his needs to be met because by faith he believes that since God promised that he wouldn't meet his needs, that by faith I'm going to ask God to do it because I believe he will. Right? Forgiveness. What's that? Repentance. Right? These are all the steps for prayer. But you don't have to. Sometimes I repented earlier. Right? Not saying that I'm perfect, but if God's not dealing with me about repenting at that moment, God lays somebody on my heart. I'm not going to waste God's time right, by praying something other than what God wants me to pray. Just praying in the Holy Ghost. True prayer is not you praying what you want to pray. True prayer is you praying what God wants you to pray. Talking to God about the things that God wants to talk to you about. Really, reading your Bible is an exercise in prayer. I'm asking the Lord to show me something and then listening for the direction of the Holy Ghost to read what God wants me to read. And then stay in there until God gets the point across to me. There are times i got to read something for a few days until it finally clicks. Right? But by faith, I'm staying there because God wants me to show something or wants to show me something. God wants to get, I know there's something there, so by faith, I'm going to stay here until God delivers it. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Right, Lord, I know I have my own desires, but I don't even know my own heart because it's deceitfully wicked. Lord, my desires in my ignorance and in my inability to grasp God's true perfect will, what I desire may not be in the will of God. So Lord, I'm going to set my desires aside. Lord, have me pray as you would have me pray. That takes faith. That takes discernment. You've got to be built up on your faith before you can really start praying the way that God wants you to pray. That's why, in truth, there is no sinner's prayer when they come to God. You know what you prayed when you got saved? What God had dealt with you, with you about through the Holy Ghost. But I know it went something like this. You came, said that Jesus is a sinner, and asked God to save you. Well, how do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because with the mouth confession is made unto righteousness, with the heart man believeth unto salvation. Well, you, say, you got to admit that you're not holy, He is, and you believe that He'll save you and make you like Him. That's the requirements to getting saved, other than the fact that the Holy Ghost has to deal with you. Because no man comes unto the Father except Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, draws them. What did you pray when you got saved? What God told you to pray? Every time you've really done business with God in the prayer closet, you know what you prayed? Whatever the Holy Ghost told you to pray. And when you don't know what to pray, you just believe by faith that the Holy Ghost is taking those groanings and utterings that can't be discerned by man and taking them to the throne room of God and you're just waiting on God to do something even when you don't even know what to pray. He's saying it's not enough to, you know, 
bow down. We know that God's not in vain repetitions as the, the heathen, right? The unbeliever. They think that through much talking, they're going to merit favor with God. Sometimes the most favor that you're ever going to find in the eyes of God is when you're not saying a word, but yet the Holy Ghost is taking those things that are groaning from your very soul, and He's taking those to the throne room of God. In the last days, He's saying, it's not enough just to fall down before God and say, Lord, please do this and please do that. No, Lord... I don't have time to waste your time and the world certainly doesn't have time because it's waxing worse and worse. I'm going to pray what you want me to pray and nothing else. Lord, get me to the point that one, I know your will, but then I'm praying that your will be done. And that I ask nothing amiss that I might consume it upon my own lust. Because Lord, I know if I ask, I'm going to receive. If I seek, I'm going to find. And if I knock, it's going to be open. So I want to pray your will and make your will my desire so that I can see your will done and my desires be fulfilled. In order to pray, as he's saying here, in the Holy Ghost, you have to be past the point of meddling in sin, dabbling in sin, straddling the fence, trying to serve two masters. You can't pray in the Holy Ghost if you haven't been in fellowship with the Holy Ghost all week. You can't come and lay prostrate before God and pray what God wants you to pray if you haven't been anywhere near His Word, if you haven't been in fellowship, if you haven't been meditating on the things of God, if you haven't been out there walking hand in hand with Jesus. He's saying, build yourselves up on your most holy faith, but then, why do we build ourselves up so that we can walk with the Lord every day? We've got a sure foundation. So he's saying, make sure your house is built the right way so that you can leave the house, not have to worry about it falling in on itself because you build it on Jesus, and you can go out and walk in the world and live the will of God. We're not to be huddled inside of the church. No, the church is supposed to be advancing. We're supposed to be building out there, but too many of us trying to patch all the holes in our house. You know why the holes keep showing up? Because you're trying to put bricks made of clay in there. He says, wood, hay, and stubble is going to burn up, but we can use things that will last for all of eternity to build our lives upon. He's saying, once you build yourselves up, continually building yourselves up on your most holy faith, then you can get to the point where you walk, you can talk every day, every second of every day in the perfect will of God by the guiding of the Holy Ghost you can do it if we couldn't do it why would the Apostle Paul have written pray without ceasing God wouldn't command you to do something that you can't do because then God's just making you a sinner if God said be ye holy and he knew that there was no way for us to be holy then he marked us as sinners for all of eternity and he knew that we couldn't keep it. But no, he commands us after we get saved, be ye holy. Why? Because through the leading and guiding of the Holy Ghost, through him putting you on the potter's wheel, you can be holy. Not in his flesh, but roped in his righteousness, you can have a life that is holy for God. You say, well that takes a lot of work, that's got to be hard. Yeah. But if it's worth having... It's worth the effort. Then he goes on to say, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. He says, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Two things I see here. This is where I really wanted to get to today for the lesson. See, if you're in the love of God, then we get the latter part of the verse, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're living outside the love of God, you cannot expect the mercies of God. You cannot expect the grace of God. God doesn't pour out His blessings unto the world. Why? Because they would be waste. He only pours it out to His children. But the prodigal, when he's down there in the hog pen, the father wasn't showing up and giving him more of an allowance. 
He knew that in order to get the benefits of the Father, where do you have to be? At the Father's house. So why would we expect, even though you may be saved on your way to heaven, if you're not living in the love of God, how in the world could you expect to be blessed of God? He says, we're looking for the mercies of God. Daily He loadeth us with benefit. Right? He blesses us so good it almost breaks us. If you really took the, the time to think about how good God is to you, it certainly would break your heart. But God's so good that we can't even comprehend this side of heaven how much God loads us up with every day. But how can we expect or how can we be looking for the mercies of God when we know we're not in the position to receive them? The love of God is a place but the love of God is also a mindset. Keep that in mind. But he says, keeping yourselves in the love of God. Did not God tell us that He loved us with an everlasting love? That means that God's love is just as permanent as He is. Because it says that God is love. Love is just as much a part of God as holiness and His righteous indignation and his eyes of fire. But see, God doesn't keep us there. God's love's always been. And it's been in the same spot. Just as he's forever settled in heaven, right? his love has been forever established. It is a place. God doesn't keep you there. God knows where his love is. If God's love was this stage, this stage don't move throughout the week. Right? When we go out in the sanctuary, guess what? Stage stays here. It's got the same perimeter that it did last week and ever since the building was built. Right? It is unchanging. It's unmovable. Why? Because Brother Ray put it in and he made it permanent. Right? It's sturdy. It ain't going nowhere. Even if you wanted to drag it somewhere, you could try, but you're going to try and take it out that door. Right? The world cannot contain the love of God. Right? We could... You don't have time to get into it. But the love of God is so beyond our understanding. We think that we know the love of God. God's going to laugh at us for a little bit in heaven. Like, y'all remember when you thought you knew how much I loved you? No, this is how much I love you. See, all that is the place. But it says keeping yourself in the love of God. What's that mean? You have the choice, the mindset to stay in the love of God. Just as God's love never moves, spiritually, you've got to stay in the love of God. You're going to be going, out, you're going, to, be going to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, maybe the uttermost parts of the world, in the world. But spiritually, you've still got to be centered in the love of God. Not only one, because of the benefits. If I'm in the love of God, I know His mercies are going to be overflowing. They're going to be abounding. I'm going to have to press them down. I'm going to have to shake it together, and it's still going to be bubbling over. Right? I'm not going to be able to contain it. But, I'm not there for the benefits. I am in the love of God because I love Him. Right? Being in the love of God, that's where you have fellowship. That's where you have friendship. That's where you have the one that sticketh closer than a brother. If you walk away from those things, God didn't walk away from you. You left. His love's been the exact same ever since it was first offered. Way before He ever formed anything in this galaxy, God's love was in the exact same place. And, really blow your mind, God's love had enough room for you long before you ever came along. He made a spot in His love with your name on it. Because Jesus died for all men. That means that there's enough room for everyone that ever has been in the love of God. But He says, keeping yourselves in the love of God. Being in the love of God changes you. If you're in the love of God, God's love's going to start rubbing off on you. You think it's any accident? That when 
They were inspired to write about the fruits of the Spirit. The first one is love. That's not talking about love as the world knows love. That's talking about the new creature in you developing the love of God in your life. You keep yourself in the love of God, you're going to love as God loves. That means you won't love on the outward appearance. You're going to look past what they are and see what they need. That means that you're going to love with the intensity that God loves. We've already said it. There's never been a time since before time existed that God did not love you. That means that if God burdens your heart to love somebody, it doesn't matter what they do, where they are, how long it's been since they talked to you, you're going to have the same fervent love for them that you did when God gave you the burden. Right? The love of God and the love of God in your life doesn't have an intensity scale. It's dialed up to 11 all the time. Why? Because you want to show them the love that God showed you. You don't want to cheat them or be the reason that they die and go to hell because you didn't want to love the way that God said to love. Being in the love of God will change the way that you look outwardly. Because that which belongs to God doesn't look like the world. Now again, you've got to keep yourself there, which means when God starts dealing with you about it, you're going to have to either change to what God wants you to be, or you're going to leave the love of God. Keeping yourself in the love of God. That means that by context, it says the world's going to try and draw you away from it. Pull you away from the love of God. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.